This patient underwent an uneventful phaco emulsification with the implantation of a single piece monofocal hydrophilic IOL. Early in the postoperative period, this patient was found to have a hyperopic refractive surprise. The patient was counseled in detail where we understood what were the patient's complaints, what were his expectations. We ensured that the patient understood what the surgical plan was what were the potential complications of the procedure and whether there were any other options that could be considered to take care of this refractive surprise. After an in-depth counselling, a decision was taken to go ahead with an IOL explantation and the implantation of a suitable powered monofocal IOL. Let's move to the IOL explantation surgery itself. Under adequate viscoelastic cover, the surgeon uses either a Sinsky hook or a Kuglin hook and rotates the IUL into the anterior chamber. Adequate viscoelastic is placed both behind it to push the posterior capsule away as well as above it to protect the endothelium. The IUL, once stabilized with the help of strong forceps, is cut from the inner superior optic haptic junction all the way through to the opposite inner end of the optic haptic junction and therefore is bisected into two almost equal halves. In order to facilitate ease of removal, each of the two now bisected halves is now rotated to come to lie in line with the incision and is carefully removed through the main incision. Explanting an IOL is technically a lot more challenging than implanting one. The skill set required in actually doing so is significant and it's very often that the surgeon who has operated on the eye is not surgically experienced enough to perform this technically rather challenging surgical procedure. The surgeon needs to be absolutely clear as to what exactly is the indication for the IOL explantation. An IOL that is opacified, an IOL that is tilted as a result of capsular fibrosis or an IOL that is decentered for various reasons definitely require explantation. On the other hand, we could differ IOL explantation should you have a patient who very early on in the post-operative period after a multifocal IOL may complain of photic phenomena and we do know that they can settle over a period of time or for a patient who is dissatisfied as a result of a small refractive surprise and there could be another option to sort it like just perhaps a pair of glasses, contact lenses, surface ablation or an add-on lens. We should proceed with deliberation. We should proceed with planning to explant an IOL only if we are extremely certain that the cause of the patient's post-operative visual symptoms is the IOL itself. Tests such as a corneal topography or a macular OCT may be required to rule out other causes of the patient's symptoms. Next comes planning the timing of the IOL explantation. If a decision is taken to explant the IOL, it's better to be done much earlier rather than later because further delay would result in excessive fibrosis which may end up causing significant challenges in the surgical explantation of the IOL. It is important to evaluate the status of the eye. This includes 1. Understanding what was the nature of the IOL that was implanted primarily with respect to its material and its design. What is the position of the IOL with respect to the capsular bag? 3. What is the status of the anterior capsule? What is the status of the posterior capsule? Look for the presence of pseudophacodonosis which could signify the presence of a subluxation. What is the status of the corneal endothelium? And finally, what is the status of the macula? The very important perioperative considerations should include one, making sure that when we do operate, we do not endanger the endothelium and that we respect the incision such that we do not induce an excessive astigmatism. It is very important that we have at hand the correct microsurgical instruments that would allow us to one, not only hold the IOL very sturdy and two, the correct scissors that will help us cut easily the IOL through its entirety. And I believe that since these surgeries can be sometimes unpredictable, it's very important to have a well set up vitrectomy unit as well as having a retinal backup should you ever require a scleral fixated IOL. Let us now understand together what is the optimal orientation, that is, how the lens should be placed in the eye, how exactly it should be held prior to cutting it 
in the anterior chamber. I am a left-handed surgeon, so I would hold the lens with my non-dominant right hand in a manner like this. The grip on the eyewear needs to be firm and until the lens is now cut, we should not let go of this grip. Moving on to what should be the orientation of the lens. Now I am a surgeon who has made her main incision at 65, approximately 65 degrees, which means the scissors that are going to be used to cut the IOL will be introduced clearly not through the side port, but through the main incision. Now, if I need to cut the lens with the scissors entering the eye at about 65 degrees, the orientation of the IOL should be like this, which means that when I start to cut the lens, we always start to cut it at the inner edge of the superior optic haptic junction and we move so we start to cut it at the inner edge of the optic haptic junction and we go all the way across diametrically 180 degrees across to end at the inner edge of the inferior optic haptic junction so the orientation needs to be such that when the scissors enters the eye, it should very easily reach the proximal optic haptic junction. Now, the aim is to cut the lens from here all the way to the opposite optic haptic junction. One option is to go in here and continue to cut the lens all the way across. When we do that, we are left with two halves of the optic each of which is connected to one of the haptic now the haptic and the optic as you can see are all in one line this allows for the removal of half of the optic which is in line with one of the haptics another technique of bisecting this IOL will be demonstrated now now if you were to cut the lens from this edge all the way to the other end. The scissors keep moving in a direction opening and closing till you get to the other end. Moreover, often you don't always reach exactly the other end because whilst cutting the lens, you may change the direction a little bit. I also find that when we try to cut the lens exactly from one end all the way to the other, there is a significant movement of the scissors in the periphery where you have a fairly shallow anterior chamber. So the other way in which you can manage this is having bisected half of the IOL, you can rotate it around through 180 degrees. So now the distal part which you would otherwise be cutting in the periphery becomes the proximal part. Not only that, you're able to decide what should be the starting point of cutting at this edge and the IOL can then be cut to once more giving you two equal halves of the optic connected to the haptic in such a way it allows for the ease of its removal that is when the haptic is held with the McPherson's and pulled out of the incision there is no resistance to its removal. I'd like you all to note the actual thickness of the IOL down its center. The lenses are quite thick in the middle, thereby necessitating a significant opening of the blades of the scissors to be able to cut it effectively. We must take care when we are cutting the central part of the lens to avoid any damage to the corneal endothelium. We do know that sometimes when we remove these IOLs that have been cut in the eye, we end up with significant wound distortion. Now here's a way in which you can achieve two things. One, smaller sizes of the fragments of the IOLs to prevent any damage to the wound. And secondly, a way in which we do not need to cut through the thick central part of the IOL. Now here's what I think would also work. So we cut the optic into three pieces instead of two. The first cut made like this. The second cut made like this and then you're left with the third part of the IOL. So what you will notice is three smaller pieces of IOL which could be removed 
from the eye with significant ease without damaging the incision. This brings us to the end of the rather extensive tutorial on eye oil explantation techniques. I hope you found it useful. Thank you.